Good afternoon and welcome back to another episode of The Longing, where today we are going to be continuing to read The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham. So, let's get going. With a quaking heart but as firm a footstep as he could command, Toad set forth cautiously on what seemed to be a most harebrained and hazardous undertaking. But he was soon agreeably surprised to find how easy everything was made for him, and a little humbled at the thought that both his popularity and the sex that seemed to inspire it were really another's. The washerwoman's squat figure in its familiar cotton print seemed a passport for every barred door and grim gateway. Even when he hesitated, uncertain as to the right turning to take, he found himself helped out of his difficulty by the warder at the next gate, anxious to be off to his tea, summoning him to come along sharp and not keep him waiting there all night. The chaff and the humorous sallies to which he was subjected, and to which of course he had to provide prompt and effective reply, formed indeed his chief danger. For Toad was an animal with a strong sense of his own dignity, and the chaff was, mostly, he thought, poor and clumsy, and the humour of the sallies entirely lacking. However, he kept his temper, though with great difficulty, suited his retorts to his company and his supposed character, and did his best not to overstep the limits of good taste. It seemed hours before he crossed the last courtyard, rejected the pressing invitations from the last guardroom, and dodged the outspread arms of the last warder, pleading with simulated passion for just one farewell embrace. But at last he heard the wicket gate in the great outer door click behind him, felt the fresh air of the outer world upon his now his anxious brow, and knew that he was free. Dizzy with the easy success of his daring exploit, he walked quickly towards the lights of the town, not knowing in the least what he should do next, only quite certain of one thing, that he must remove himself as quickly as possible from the neighbourhood where the lady he was forced to represent was so well known and so popular a character. As he walked along, considering his attention was caught by some red and green lights a little way off to one side of the town, and the sound of the puffing and snorting of engines and the banging of shunted trucks fell on his ear. Aha, he thought, this is a piece of luck. A railway station is the thing I want most in the whole world at, the, at this moment, and what's more, I needn't go through the town to get it. And I sh and shan't have to support this humiliating character by repartees, which, though thoroughly effective, do not assist one's self sense of self-respect. He made his way to the station accordingly, consulted a timetable, and found that a train bound more or less in the direction of his home was due to start in half an hour. More luck, said Toad, his spirits rising rapidly, and went off to the booking office to buy his ticket. He gave the name of the station that he knew to be nearest to the village, of which Toad Hall was the principal figure, feature, sorry, and mechanically put his fingers in search of the necessary money where his waistcoat pocket should have been. But here the cotton gown, which had nobly stood by him so far, and which he had basely forgotten, intervened and frustrated his efforts. In a sort of nightmare he struggled with the strange uncanny thing that seemed to hold his hands turn all muscular strivings to water, and laugh at him all the time. While other travellers, forming up in a line behind, waited with impatience, making suggestions of more or less value and comments of more or less stringency and point. At last, somehow, he never rightly understood how, he burst the barriers, attained the goal, arrived at where all waistcoat pockets are eternally situated, and found not only no money, but no pocket to hold it, and no waistcoat to hold the pocket. To his horror he recollected that he had left both coat and waistcoat behind him in his cell, and with them his pocket book, money, keys, watch, matches, pencil case, all that makes life worth living, all that distinguishes the many-pocketed animal, the lord of creation, from the inferior one-pocketed or no-pocketed productions that hop or trip about permissively unequipped for the real contest. In his misery he made one desperate effort to carry the thing off, and, with a return to his old, fine old manner, a blend of the squire and the college don, 
he said. Look here, I find I've left my purse behind. Just give me that ticket, will you, and I'll send the money on tomorrow. I'm well known in these parts. The clerk stared at him and the rusty black bonnet a moment, and then laughed. I should think you were pretty well known in these parts, he said, if you've tried this game on often. Here, stand away from the window, please, madam. You're obstructing the other passengers. An old gentleman who had been prodding him in the back for some moments here thrust him away, and, what was worse, addressed him as, he, as his good woman, which angered Toad more than anything that had occurred that evening. Baffled and full of despair, he wandered blindly down the platform where the train was standing, and tears trickled down each side of his nose. It was hard, he thought, to be within sight of safety and almost of home, and to be balked by the want of a few wretched shillings, and by the pettifogging mistrustfulness of paid officials. Very soon his escape would be discovered, the hunt would be up, he would be caught, reviled, loaded with chains, dragged back again to prison, and bread and water and straw, his guards and penalties would be doubled, and, oh, what sarcastic remarks the girl would make. What was to be done? He was not swift of foot, his figure was unfortunately recognisable. Could he not squeeze under the seat of a carriage? He had seen this method adopted by schoolboys when the journey money provided by thoughtful parents had been diverted to other and better ends. As he pondered, he found himself opposite the engine, which was being oiled, wiped, and generally caressed by its affectionate driver, a burly man with an oil can in one hand and a lump of cotton waste in the other. Hello, mother, said the engine driver. What's the trouble? You don't look particularly cheerful. Oh, sir, said Toad, crying afresh. I am a poor and happy washerwoman, and I've lost all my money, and can't pay for a ticket, and I must get home tonight somehow, and whatever I am to do I don't know, oh dear, oh dear. That's a bad biz business indeed, said the engine driver reflectively. Lost your money, and can't get home, and got some kids too waiting for you, I dare say. Any amount of them, sobbed Toad, and they'll be hungry, and playing with matches, and upsetting lamps, and little inno the little innocents and quarrelling and going on generally. Oh dear, oh dear. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do, said the good engine driver. You're a washerwoman to your trade, says you. Very well, that's that, and I'm an engine driver, as you, may, you well may see, and there's no denying it's terribly dirty work. Uses up a power of shirts it does, till my missus is fair tired of washing em. If you'll wash a few shirts for me when you get home, and send them along. I'll give you a ride on my engine. It's against the company's regulations, but we're not so very particular in these out-of-the-way parts. The toad's misery turned into rapture, as he eagerly scrambled up into the cab of the engine. Of course, he had never washed a shirt in his life, and couldn't if he tried. And, anyhow, he wasn't going to begin. But, he thought, when I get safely home to Toad Hall, and have money again, and pockets to put it in, I will send the dr engine driver enough to pay for a quite a, a quantity of washing, and that will be the same thing, or better. The guard waved his welcome flag, the engine driver whistled in cheerful response, and the train moved out of the station. As the speed increased and the toad could see on either side of him real fields and trees and hedges and cows and horses, all flying past him, and as he thought how every minute was bringing him nearer to Toad Hall, and sympathetic friends, and money to chink in his pocket, and a soft bed to sleep in, and good things to eat, and praise and admiration at the recital of his adventures and his surpassing cleverness. He began to skip up and down and shout and sing snatches of song, to the great astonishment of the engine driver, who had come across washerwomen before, at long intervals, but never one like at all like this. They had covered many and many a mile, and Toad was already considering what he would have for supper as soon as he got home, when he noticed that the engine driver, with a puzzled expression on his face, was leaning over the side of the engine and listening hard. Then he saw him climb onto the coals and gaze out over the top of the train. Then he returned and said to Toad, It's very strange. We're the last train running in this direction tonight. 
Yet I could be sworn that I heard another following us. Toad ceased his frivolous antics at once. He became grave and depressed, and a dull pain in the lower part of his spine, communicating itself to his legs, made him want to sit down and try desperately not to think of all the possibilities. By this time, the moon was shining brightly, and the engine driver steadying himself on the coal could command a view of the line behind them for a long distance. And with that, we come to the end of the episode. So, I will say thank you very much for joining me today. Um, I hope you all have a wonderful morning, evening, afternoon or night. No matter what time of day it is, I hope you all have a wonderful one of it. And as always, we will be back tomorrow for more of The Longing. Goodbye.